Chapter 6, Practice Taking Leaps of Faith. Self-trust is the first secret of success. Ralph Waldo Emerson. This is Zero Frequency, The Easiest Way to Peace, Happiness, and Abundance by Mabel Katz. We are going to look at Chapter 6 and Chapter 7 today. You can follow along in the book. Uh, as I'm reading and doing commentary and doing reviews, uh, I read part of chapter six. So from what I've read, I'm going to give this reading five stars out of five stars. If I need to deviate anything, I will let you know. But chapter six is such a great, heartwarming, inspiring um, lesson chapter seven practice gratitude I'm sure it's just going to be just as great and inspiring I love gratitude I say thank you I don't know how many times a day I, that's one of my fra favorite phrases of ho'oponopono besides I love you I love saying thank you and uh, I say it in my mind and I tell people as often as I'm reminded to or guided to rather uh, by divinity, I tell people thank you because I do appreciate them. Even if um, they aren't the good guys in my life, I still can give the person thanks. If not verbally, then definitely within my heart because they are progressing me and moving me forward. They are helping me to clear so I don't have to hopefully face the situation again uh, with whatever is going on. I'm going to put the link to Amazon and I think if I can find it in Barnes and Noble, I will put the link to the book uh, through the Barnes and Noble website. Right now I'm not affiliated, so um, this is not an affiliation or anything like that. I'm, I don't get anything uh, by putting the links in. I just love Ho'oponopono and I love how it has changed, it transformed my life uh, tremendously and so I just love sharing what has been helpful for me and uh, if you find it inspiring I hope that you do Ho'oponopono as well. Okay so chapter six. After my divorce I moved into the beautiful townhouse I told you about and that I could not really afford on my own then. When I saw it I knew God had found it for me. The townhouse had three levels, which allowed living space for my kids on one level, communal living space on another level, and a place for my work on another level. The grounds surrounding the house were amazing, with beautiful gardens, a swimming pool, and lovely walking paths. My teacher used to say, whoever designed these grounds was in love. So true. The townhouse was the perfect place for my new life. My friend had suggested we move in together so we could find a nicer place. The rent was almost $2,000 a month. Before we signed the lease, my friend changed her mind. And $2,000 a month, um, I'm not sure how long ago that was, but that's a pretty penny. Probably about $3,000 by today's standards. Uh, let's see. So uh, the rent was almost $2,000 a month. Before we signed the lease, my friend changed her mind. The sensible decision would have been to find something that would fit my budget. Instead, I decided to move forward. I signed the lease by myself, thinking I would find another roommate to help me cover the rent. I did not find another roommate. Very soon, my accounting practice started making more money. So much money that I did not need a roommate. I tell you this story not to inspire you to rent or commit to buying something you can't afford, but to show you that when you trust, God delivers. I didn't wait until I had enough money for the townhouse. I followed my heart, not my mind. I trusted myself and took a leap of faith. When I got divorced, I told myself, I don't need to own a house to be happy. I can rent for the rest of my life. I hadn't considered the fact that when you rent a house, you may have to leave if the owner decides to sell it. 
that's what happened to me. The owner came to me and said, Mabel, I know you love this place, but I'm going to put it on the market. I'm giving you notice in case you want to buy it. Of course I wanted to stay in the beautiful townhouse. I didn't have enough money for the down payment, and I couldn't qualify for a mortgage because I didn't have a long history of stable income. Still, I had been practicing self-trust for several years, and so I took another leap of faith. I thought, if God wants me to stay here, he'll get me the mortgage. If I don't get the mortgage, that means that God has a better place for me. I did not even have to contact a loan agent. The loan agent called me to offer his help. I got the loan and the house was mine. Yes, woo! I love it. These things can happen to anyone, even you, but there is a secret. You need to practice self-trust. Each time you notice you are worrying or thinking too much about something, you must take a leap of faith and give God permission to intervene. In chapter one, I shared the story of my reconnection to self. When I gave myself permission to trust again and follow my heart, I relearned how to take decisions from inspiration rather than from my intellect, ego. I made illogical decisions and guess what? Those decisions provided me with the best results. The more I practiced self-trust, the more God provided. I took one leap of faith after another, first my divorce, then starting my own accounting practice, then leaving my successful business to help people through speaking, training, and writing. Along the way, there were many other leaps of faith, too many to count. All of them, yes, all of them, ultimately resulted in more happiness, peace, and abundance in my life. When I chose to let go of my accounting profession and dedicate my life to helping people have more joyful and successful lives, the logical plan would have been to start when I had a reasonable amount of savings. Although those were not my circumstances, I made the decision to do it anyway. Actually, changing from, from a successful career to a completely different career with no guarantee it would work was even more illogical, but I knew it was the right choice for me. What was it that allowed me to be so courageous and do these things? Just one thing, trust. I valued my life and I knew that my choices were not only for my own personal benefit, but for the benefit of all. It was not because it was me but rather because when we take a leap of faith and let divinity guide us, we affect everybody in a good way. I'm going to say that one more time. When we take a leap of faith and let divinity guide us, we affect everybody in a good way. Trust is the magic word. Since nothing that happens is a mere coincidence, one day I unexpectedly received a free audio by Napoleon Hill. I decided to listen to it. Napoleon Hill was one of the first, first self-improvement and personal success writers. Uh, let's see, he has a book called The Laws of Success. Oh, and of course, Think and Grow Rich. Uh, the Laws of Success were written in the 1920s and Think and Grow Rich was written in the 30s. So um, I believe Laws of, The Laws of Success was written in 1928, so almost 100 years ago, you guys. Uh, let's see. Many self-improvement courses are based on his teachings, especially those relying on the mind, such as neuro-linguistic programming, NLP. In the audio, Napoleon Hill spoke about various spiritual subjects and of such concepts as abundance and success, which nowadays have become the theme for many spiritual leaders, authors, and speakers. After listening to that audio, I started reading Napoleon Hill's works and found something very interesting about trust. 
He considers it essential for success. He says that trust is one of those things that cannot be taught but can be built by auto-suggestion that we first must begin to trust and that the more we practice trust, the more we hypnotize ourselves into it, the more it will become second nature to us. I love that. Trusting became my practice. Whenever I heard those tiny voices telling me that I wasn't good enough or that I couldn't do it, or whenever I was in a difficult or scary situation, I would choose to stop all the stories in my mind by telling myself, I'm going to let go and trust. I had actually been doing auto-suggestion without knowing it. And she made that one of her suggestions. I forgot which chapter it was, but she was having us affirm, I let go and trust. I let go and trust. It might have been in the letting go chapter. I think, let's see, I'm going to pull up the chapters. Ah, it could have been in chapter one because chapter one is trust. The universe is waiting for you. Uh, yeah, it probably was in chapter one where she had us do those that, excuse me, where she had us do that affirmation about trust. Okay, let's see. Napoleon Hill provides a slightly macabre, but very interesting example of how auto-suggestion works. He says that those who kill for the first time feel as though they can hardly bear to be in their body. They feel tremendous anguish. When they kill a second time, they feel uncomfortable, but not as much as the first time. And once they've killed several times, they feel nothing. Killing doesn't affect them anymore. Hill uses this as an example of auto-suggestion. So why not use the power of auto-suggestion to attract a life of peace and happiness? I suggest you try it. Because when you start trusting, you will find the happiness and peace you're looking for. And happy and peaceful people will undoubtedly be successful. Trusting is a decision and a practice. Trusting is not only a decision, but it's a practice. Our decisions cause consequences in our lives. We change our destinies. Oh, okay. I'm going to go back because this is coming up uh, in my mind. I was at a restaurant today and I was in line to order to go, me and my friend. And the people in front of us, there was a group of four in front of us. They ordered and then they left and then... Another group of four came and jumped ahead and of us in line when it was supposed to be our turn. So I said, what's going on here? And I didn't have, um, it wasn't anger. It was more of a curiosity, a tone of curiosity and an attitude of curiosity. Now, had I not been one to do ho'oponopono, I'd have been like, uh, you guys are cutting <laughs> I would have had a big attitude, but it was just like, what's going on here? And they explained that they had to put their bags down uh, because they're a group and they all have their computers out. And I get it. I've been there before. I've studied at different like Starbucks and um, I didn't want to leave my stuff. So my friend will stay behind and then I'll order. But what happened was uh, the boss of the group, the leader of the group, she ended up paying for everyone's meals. So uh, the cash register was still open. And so, and I, and I could see that I was alert to that. I was aware of that fact and I was okay with it once the lady explained, but my friend was kind of, I think she was hangry. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I said, it's okay. And my friend is a Christian, so she's like praying out loud. I bring every thought under the captivity of Christ. But I went through that example because trust, you know, I trusted the lady. I trusted the circumstance, you know, had before Ho'oponopono, I would have 
had an attitude, a chip on my shoulder. How dare people just cut in front of me? But uh, when you practice Ho'oponopono, trusting becomes a practice and it becomes automatic, actually. Our decisions cause consequences, going back to the book, our decisions cause consequences in our lives. We change our destinies at any given moment in accordance with our choices. We can choose to react or not react, let go or not let go. This is the question and the secret. In my life, once I started trusting myself, I found God. For me, God is the part inside me that knows better. It's my connection to the dance and the wisdom of the whole universe. And it's inside you too. When people don't believe, I ask them, who thought of the human body or the flowers in the oceans? You guys, our human body is so wise. Even illness speaks to us. When we become sick, um, sometimes I get a sore throat and I know that's when it's a signal for me. It's when I'm not able to speak up for myself or I didn't speak up for myself. And that is a signal for me to check within to see where I feel like I'm not able to have a voice. And our bodies are designed so intricately. And that's just one part. Um, there's a book by Louise Hay, You Can Heal Your Life, if you want to learn more about it. You Can Heal Your Body is another book. I believe that's the title of the second book. But she gives you different ailments and um, at the end of Heal Your Life, she gives you different ailments. And then um, the other book, the second book, is a little book. And in that book, she gives you the ailments. And I think it might be the same information. But if you're experiencing something like anemia, then she tells you what thinking pattern caused that illness. And there are other authors that do that as well. Um, there's a book by Julia Cameron's, can't, excuse me, Julia Cannon's daughter. I can't think of her name right now, but she also wrote a book about the body and mind connection. And so, um, you know, who designed this body that can speak to us on a subconscious level? Who designed the flowers, the beautiful flowers, some of them that release amazing fragrances? Um, who designed the ocean that not only it calms you as you listen to the sounds, but as you're walking on the sand barefooted, you're getting healing ions who designed all that, you guys? It doesn't, going back to the book, it doesn't matter what you call it. You need to realize there is a more intelligent mind than yours. You have to realize you don't know and become humble. You have to become humble. Have you ever noticed how much we trust the negative? We know that life can change for the worse in a second. We accept the possibility that we may have an accident, be told we have cancer, or suddenly die. Why can't we similarly trust the positive? Why don't we trust that our lives can change for the better in a second? If we become present and conscious and trust our own wisdom, our lives will definitely change for the better moment by moment. And it helps if you're not consuming things that are negative. Uh, one of the reasons why I like reading the Bible is because there is an overall positive arching theme, an overall um, arching, did I say that right? An overall positive theme throughout it. Um, books like this, you can just reread these books. Louise, the one book that I mentioned by Louise Hayes, you can read her books. If you've read all these books over and over and over, Think and Grow Rich. Um, what's that one? Yes, that's the one that Bob Proctor talks about. If you read, if you read his book um, about shifting your paradigm, if you just consumed your mind and watched videos and TV shows with positivity and cut out the commercials about medicine you know and this medicine will give you side effects uh and i know let me 
rephrase that. I was about to say, I know the news is negative. Um, however, Dr. Hugh Lynn would watch the news and he would clear. So uh, if you have to be around something negative, if you have to consume something negative, if you're around an energy vampire, quote unquote, uh, go ahead and do Ho'oponopono because that will start clearing some of that stuff out. But the way the world is designed now, it's designed towards the negative to program you towards the negative. That's why it's easy for us to trust the negative. But if you consume more life-giving content, then you can expect good things to happen in an instant. And as much as I've been doing Ho'oponopono, uh, my doctor sent me to get a test because she saw inflammation in my body. And uh, when I read what the test was, because they had to send it out, it's not something that they could do on site. It was talking about leukemia. I'm like, oh my God, what is this? But I knew better not to... Uh, ruminate and fixate and obsess over the test I'm just like okay all we know is that there's inflammation in my body I don't feel like I have cancer so I don't think that's it you know we'll wait for the test results but in the meantime I'm going to live my life and I'm going to do Ho'oponopono and I'm going to be joyful and happy and uh, the two weeks have passed and Yay, I don't have leukemia or anything like that. <laughs> I just have inflammation. So that's, well, I don't want to say that's good, but um, that's a relief, I'll say. Okay. Uh, let's see. Why are you waiting? Do you remember the story about the Romanian sisters, Katia and Sylvie? Katia had come to a Ho'oponopono a Ho'oponopono training, hoping that I would fix her sister Sylvie's mental disability. You might also remember that at the end of zero frequency training on the second day, Katia and Sylvie danced along with all the other attendees. And I haven't yet shared with you another conversation I had with Katya at the end of that second day. You know, my belle, she said, I always wanted to be a dancer, but my father wouldn't let me. Katya went on to explain that she felt she should pursue a more serious profession. So she became a physician. I'm going to go for it, Katya told me. I'm going to start dancing. Wonderful, I said. Take your sister. This will be so important for the two of you to enjoy together. Now, I'm used to hearing similar announcements. So many people come to my zero frequency trainings and classes and come away with a new commitment to joy, which often involves recommitting to a deeply held desire. What did surprise me was Katya's response. What I meant, my belle, is I'm going to dance professionally on the stage. Katya appeared to be in her 50s and now was going to try to become a professional dancer long after many dancers have retired. You know, why not? My surprise at her answer revealed my own preconceived notions about career dancers. Who is to say that Katya could not realize her dream? That day, she fell back in love with something that at once brought her great joy and there is great power in a happy pursuit. In her eyes, I could see that she had no doubt she would dance on the stage one day. Yes, Katya, I am clapping for you and snapping my fingers. Okay, we often make decisions based on doubt and lack of self-trust. Yes, that is so true, you guys. Um, I have been playing it safe for all of my life and I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to play big. We don't love and accept ourselves. Again and again, we look for acceptance from the outside. Of course, if our inner state is lacking in acceptance and trust, what can we expect from the outside? Again, life is that mirror. It's a reflection of what's going on inside of us. 
when you trust yourself, you will also trust life because after all, you are here as an expression of life itself and life doesn't believe in waste. It hasn't made the effort to bring you here for no reason. God, the universe, knows your talents and is waiting for you to, to decide to manifest them. These talents are never insignificant, although life circumstances may make you perceive them that way. These talents, once again, these talents are never insignificant. Okay, life may present you um, so that you perceive them to be that way, but they are not. They are never insignificant. However, if you follow your heart's desire and you ground yourself in trust, you will be rewarded. Stephen King's story might inspire you. This successful author has sold more than 300 million copies of his books. In his book on writing, he explains his tra trajectory as a writer. There he tells us how, when he was still a teenager, he kept publisher's rejection notices pinned on his wall. When the pen became insufficient to hold the weight of his rejection notes, King substituted a hook and continued writing. It's clear that, just like many other successful entrepreneurs, Stephen King possessed an unshakable trust in himself. I hope you also develop the required trust. You guys, when I was younger, I wanted to be a DJ. I wanted to be on the radio. I wanted to be on the air. And actually, I was on the radio for a time. It was for a college uh, radio station, and I did the weather at noon. And so I was a radio person, but I always wanted to be a radio personality, but I never had the confidence, even though I took radio classes radio and television classes. I just didn't have the confidence to do it. I heard that radio, especially uh, San Francisco Bay Area, is a very competitive market. And so I went into another field, a safer field, quote unquote, safer field. And, uh, but because I love information, I love books, I'm here on YouTube. And I'm just following my passion. Who knows where this will lead? I may just uh, be a small channel, and that's fine. Or I may be a big channel, and that would be fine too. But at least I'm doing something that I know is in my heart to do. I have followed divinity to get me here. And that sparks joy for me. That makes my heart smile. And I hope that... I'm contributing positively to your lives as well by sharing the information that I have, um, sharing my stories, because I'm all about life application. It's one thing to know on a mental level, on a logical level, but it's another thing to actually apply the knowledge that we have and to experience it. And I hope by giving you my sharing my experiences that it might spark within you to have your own experiences. Um, someone did write in the comments that he started doing Ho'oponopono because of me. And it's like, wow, what if more and more people throughout the world do Ho'oponopono? That would be just life altering planet altering even you know possibly even planet altering but if just one of us does Ho'oponopono that would be good and then I'm sure because one of us is doing it and we're all connected then I'm sure another person will do it and it will become a wave if it's not its own wave already Remember this, you are here for a reason and you are unique. Never stop acknowledging the light you have within you and never underestimate your talents. I hope you decide to overcome your fears and doubts so you can have the strength to start trusting and the strength and energy to follow your calling. The world is waiting for you. And I believe I mentioned this before, but... 
uh, check out The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. Um, there are many testimonies about doing the morning pages on YouTube. You could just Google morning pages and not Google, I'm sorry. You can just YouTube search morning pages and um, many testimonies will come up because as you're doing the morning pages, you free up energy and you hear, you're able to hear yourself you get clarity and many people have been inspired to do what they were called to do what they are talented for um, because they were able to get clear in 2015 Carmen my organizer in Croatia wrote me Mabel the publisher here says there is not enough time to publish your latest book by the time you'll be coming to present in Zagreb what do you think if I publish it myself? I told her, go ahead. Carmen had organized a free introductory conference in Zagreb and I was scheduled to speak about the book and sign copies. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that city. I'm not familiar. Um, but uh, I do want to maybe look it up, Croatia. I'm making a mental note to look up that word, that city and Croatia. I was scheduled to speak about the book and sign copies. When I arrived, she handed me a copy of my book. That was the first time I saw the actual book printed in the Croatian language. It looked professionally done and beautiful. She had done a great job. As I was talking to people at the conference, I said, look at the great job she did. You know what the most interesting part of this is? She is not a professional publisher, and I am not a professional writer. Isn't it ironic The professional publisher had said it could not be done on time, and there I was in front of these people without any background or study in writing books nor in public speaking, holding my book in my hands. So the question I asked them, and I want to ask you is, what are you waiting for? What do you think you're lacking, which is an impediment to doing what you really love and want to do? You need to stop thinking and jump because God knows exactly how you're going to do it. He is just waiting for you to take the first step. You need to get out of your comfort zone, feel the fear, and then do it anyway. Believe me, when you trust and you want it so badly that you're willing to do whatever it takes, everything falls into place and everything happens effortlessly. You will look back and you will not believe your life. You will feel that you hardly had to do much. What is your ego, the crazy of the house, telling you? Do, do you believe you don't have enough education, enough money? Are, still, are you still thinking about it? What is your ego, the crazy of the house, telling you? Do you believe you don't have enough education, enough money? Are you still thinking about it? Listening and believing to what other people say you should be doing? There is nothing to think, to know, or to worry about. You already have everything you need to fulfill your mission because when you're using your innate talents, you will know why you're doing it. You will be happy and you will be doing something good for everybody because you matter. And please don't concern yourself with the how. Divinity knows how and is just waiting for you. Connect to zero frequency. The message is that we must wake up and realize who we really are. But how do we start? I get asked this question a lot. The first step is as easy as this. Decide you're going to trust and begin practicing. I understand this is the opposite of what you have been doing. I know I am asking you to trust in the unknown and this will be very uncomfortable and scary in the beginning. But believe me, it will become like second nature and you will love the results if you really let go and trust. You will 
also be giving a clear message to your inner child about what you're choosing and practicing now. Clarity is a must. Here are a few suggestions to help you begin practicing leaps of faith. Number one, mentally repeat to yourself, I let go and trust. I let go and trust. What you are doing is auto-suggestion. This means that you are consciously choosing to let go and trust moment by moment. If you are aware, you will make different decisions, you will be less reactive, and your decisions and actions will come from the part in you that knows best. Inspiration instead of programming. This is the way to let go and let God to start building the trusting muscle. Two, allow yourself to receive inspiration throughout your whole being. Allow it to fill your every cell and pour through every pore. If you feel the stimulus, the inspiration, trust it. Don't don't pay attention to your ego. Let go and you will soon be ready to embark on the adventure. The conditions will become right. There is nothing you need to know. This special part in you has the know-how. Just remain vigilant so you're not sure so you're sure not to miss the opportunities that come your way. Remain vigilant so you're sure not to miss the opportunities that come your way. Be open, alert, and flexible. Number three, as Joseph Campbell put it, my general formula for my students is follow your bliss. Find it, find where it is and don't be afraid to follow it. Stay at zero frequency, a state of flowing as much as you can. This state happens when you're happy for no specific reason, similar to the state achieved in meditation. It is where you can observe and enjoy. What this state feels like varies from person to person. To get to it, simply say stop when you realize you are looking for happiness in the outside world. Enjoy the outside, play going in and out of the state, have fun, and do not allow your emotional state to affect you. Stop and be present and allow divinity to arrange perfect happenings for you. Four, do the rocking chair exercise. Imagine you're 90 years old, sitting in a rocking chair and reflecting on your life. You're relaxed and content, satisfied with all your choices. You have accomplished and experienced everything you dreamed of and now recalling the special moments brings you joy. And now recalling the special moments brings you joy. Think back to the moments that made you smile. Remember how you used your unique talents and how trusting made a difference in your life. Imagine your 90-year-old self can talk to you now. What would you say? How would you advise yourself? Now tell yourself about the impact you've made on the world. What is the legacy you want to leave to others? Number five, take a deep breath and relax. See yourself enjoying the sunset overlooking the ocean. A young person is coming toward you. As it gets closer, you realize it is you, the adolescent version of you. What advice do you give to your younger self? What would help your younger self to be happier, to trust more, to experience more of life, to be free? So what would help your younger self to be healthier, happier, ha- and maybe healthier? What would help your younger self to trust more? What would help your younger self to experience more of life? What would help your younger self to be free? 
Okay, so that's the end of this chapter. Basically, uh, the last sentence is you can find more resources on how to go back to zero frequency at www.zerofrequency.com slash book resources. And as I was reading, I didn't want to interrupt my bell's flow, but as I was reading, it came to me that another reason why we're so quick to believe the negative is that in school, we were also programmed to believe the negative. Uh, I take college level courses and one of the courses I took more recently was a, a Native American class, a Native American studies class. And for the whole class, it seemed that we talked about the disenfranchisement of Indians, the wrongful deaths, uh, like I can't even think of all the negative things we discussed. And yes, that does have its place because we don't want history to repeat itself. Uh, we talked about the colonialization of Indians and how Indians were indoctrinated at uh, these boarding schools and some of the kids died. And as I'm saying these things, please feel free to do Ho'oponopono over that and over slavery. Because I ended up taking an African American studies course. I um, withdrew from the course because all it talked about was slavery. But I know, I haven't read the book, I haven't purchased the book, but African Americans have invented so much. We are so much more than our enslaved, I'm African American by the way, we are so much more than our enslavement. We have invented things. We pretty much built America. <laughs> and so um, why is it that these textbooks are focused on the negative? What about the accomplishment of Native Americans? Uh, what ab about the success stories? And so that's another reason why we're so quick to be negative. And so we want to let go of the negative programming and make sure we put in positive programs, if that makes sense. You know, what have been some of the accomplishments, some of the achievements of uh, African Americans? We had C.J. Walker. I think she was in the 1900s. She was one of the first successful entrepreneurs. She made the hair relaxer or back in those days it was called a permanent to permanently relax hair. So um, we have the scientist, uh, George Washington Carver, who designed lots of things to do with peanuts. Um, did he even make the cotton gin? I don't remember. Uh, there is a book that I want to read about the inventions of African Americans. So um, instead of harping on the negative, what can we focus on? And so I want you to think about that, okay? Let's get into chapter seven. I don't know if I'll finish chapter seven. I'm almost ready for a break, but I believe I told you that we would do chapter six and seven. So I at least want to start it so that I can be uh, practicing to be a woman of my word. Uh, let's see chapter seven. Oh, and it's about gratitude. Practice gratitude. I momentarily forgot, but yes. Okay. Gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all others. Cicero. Do you know the story of God and the shoemaker? Sometimes the story is told as Jesus and the shoemaker. Sometimes the minor details change, but the meaning is the same. The story goes like this. God, taking the form of a homeless man, went to see the shoemaker and asked him to repair the shoes he was wearing. He said, I am so poor that I only have one pair of shoes, and as you can see, they are ripped and useless. I don't have money to pay you for the repair, but would you fix them for me? The shoemaker said, I don't work for free. I am also poor and that repair will cost me money. 
I am God, the homeless man replied. If you fix my shoes, I can give you whatever you want. The shoemaker did not trust the man. He said, can you give me the million dollars I need to be happy? God said, I can give you one million dollars, but in return, you must give me your legs. And what good is one million dollars if I have no legs? God replied, I can give you five million dollars if you give me your arms. And what can I do with five million if I won't even be able to eat my on my own? God said, I can give you fifty million dollars if you give me your eyes. The shoemaker, who had grown increasingly agitated, said, And tell me, what could I do with so much money if I could not see the world or see the faces of my wife and children? God smiled at the shoemaker and said, Oh, my son, how can you say you are poor? I offered you fifty-six million dollars. And you did not accept it in exchange for the healthy parts of your body. Do you not see that you are rich and haven't even noticed it? I paused for a moment because I thought it just said 50 million. And it does. So I don't know how it came to 56. Oh, she must, or not she, but the story must have added the 1 and the 5 and the 50. Okay, got it. Like the shoemaker... We often don't realize how much we already have. We narrowly define wealth, not realizing how wealthy we truly are. Wealthy in love, in health, in friendship, in passion, in nature, in beauty, and in time. Mm -hmm. The shoemaker didn't realize how much he already had to say thank you for. And he didn't realize how his life, despite his financial poverty, could have been much, much worse. We rarely appreciate what we have until it is taken away from us or until there is a possibility that we will have to give it up. Practicing gratitude calls on us to recognize all we have and appreciate it. Be thankful for it. When you practice gratitude, no matter your circumstances, you open yourself to the field of all possibilities that is zero frequency. Often, we do not feel gratitude for what we have because we are always concentrating on what we think we are lacking. Our mind tells us that we know how and when things should happen. Therefore, when reality does not meet our expectations, we become angry and close our hearts. In so doing, we are unable to see the wonders of life. You see, we are very good at complaining and blaming. We focus on everything that did not go well and the times we failed. It justifies our being unhappy and stuck. However, if we stop for a moment and look at the sky, a tree, the smile of a child, or smell the scent of a rose, we'll begin to appreciate the beauty around us. We'll realize how fortunate we are and good things will begin to come into our lives. We take our lives for granted and tend to forget the immense power of gratitude. We don't stop to appreciate that we can breathe without artificial help or stand on our own two feet, or that we have two arms, and don't depend on others to bathe or get dressed. Being part of this world is a great privilege and opportunity, and we must find the way to feel appreciation and gratitude for the mere fact of being alive, no matter what. Being grateful requires less energy and time than complaining. Almost immediately, we feel lighter, happier, and very different from the feelings triggered when we complain. Gratitude will raise your vibration and is the fastest way to connect to zero frequency. Good luck or bad luck? Have you heard the story about the storms and the crop? It is a wonderful story that perfectly exemplifies what it means to live in the present without judgments. One day, a farmer asked God, Please let me rule over nature so that my crops can be more profitable. 
God agreed. When the farmer wanted rain, it came. When he asked for the bright, beautiful sun, it shone as directed. Whatever weather he asked for, he received, except at harvest when he was ugh, excuse me, except at harvest when he was surprised to discover that his efforts did not yield the riches he expected. The farmer asked God why his plan failed. God replied, You asked for what you wanted, but not for what was needed. You never asked for storms which are necessary to clean the crops, to keep away the birds and animals that destroy them, and to purify them from plagues that destroy them. So the farmer asked for rain, he asked for sun, but not the storms. Storms are necessary to clean the crops, to keep away the birds and animals that destroy them, and to purify them from plagues that destroy them. There's a deep metaphor in that because, you know, sunny days, in the words of New Edition, sunny days, everybody loves them, but can you stand the rain? Can you stand the storms, okay? The moral here is that we never know if an event is a blessing or a misfortune. So better not get attached to one or the other, nor rejoice for one and lament the other. Reality is always in the eye of the beholder. Remember, the intellect doesn't have the whole picture. Just say thank you to whatever comes your way and let go. Please know that the universe's plans are always perfect and there is no such thing as good or bad luck. And... I've noticed because I've been doing intense Ho'oponopono and when I say intense it's like at least for two hours you know how people meditate well I've been doing at least intense Ho'oponopono for two hours a day and I've noticed that when I say thank you there's more for me to be thankful for I don't know how it happens it just happens and I just noticed that circumstances have aligned themselves where there's more gratitude. Not to be preachy or religion-y on you. Um, there's a story in the Bible that said, that talked about this man versus another man versus another man. And they had different amounts of talents or coins. One man had five coins and... It multiplied into 10, and I might be getting the numbers wrong. Another man had two coins, and he used it, and it multiplied into two, turned into two. But the one man buried his, there was one man, he only had one coin, and he buried it, and nothing happened with it because it was buried. And so how I see it, what came to me just now was that when we are grateful, the gratitude multiplies. It gives us more things to be grateful for. And I wish I could give you a specific example. I can't right now, but I just know that in my life, because I write down um, different things in my planner. Every day I write down what magic will unfold today. And then I write down something magical that happened for that day. And um, it's like every day I have something to write. There's never not a day where I don't have anything to write. And sometimes I have so many things I can't even fit it in the square for the day, for today's, for that day's square. And it's just like the more you say thankful without... Um, expectation the more things happen to be grateful for I hope that makes sense it makes sense for me but I want to make sure it makes sense for you uh, let's see a different understanding of our challenges be grateful for your adversities they are always a blessing in disguise there is no coincidence for example as to who would be your boss, your peer, or your subordinate. 
Those people and situations are not there by chance, and the more challenging they are, the bigger the opportunity and the greater the reward if we choose to let go instead of react. If we talk about the divine plan for our professional life and career, everything could be an opportunity in your life to start something different and better based on your authentic yearnings of your soul and your most brilliant talents. And sometimes the only way forward is to have you lose it all or to fire you because you would be too comfortable and not move on your own. That is deep. I once worked at an insurance company. (laughs) Actually, I'm laughing because uh, I worked at a few insurance companies and they all ended up giving me a severance package because they all ended up either moving offices. Let's see. The first one, they switched their name or they were bought out. And so that call center, everyone was uh, given a severance package. Everyone was laid off. Oops, I'm going to try to switch my computer setup here. You may hear some things moving around. Let's see. Let me move my water bottle. I'm going to move my stand the computer was on. I'm going to take out this charger. Um... But uh, in the second company I worked for, we were either given the option to, we were given the option to either move to Texas or to have a severance package. And I ended up doing the uh, layoff severance package route. And clearly, You know, by the circumstances, and I think there was another one in there, which I don't remember because it was so long ago, and uh, I didn't work there for that long, but clearly, I was not meant to be in insurance. Clearly, uh, there was more, and not to say, you know, we need everyone, everyone, there's nothing wasted, you know, we need insurance people. We need people who love collecting garbage, you know, the sanitation workers, um, you know, the pandemic made me appreciate garbage workers that much more because they were essential workers. I was just like, whew, thank you. Um, But I wasn't meant to stay behind a desk and slave away me all day long for eight hours on end. I was meant to do more. I don't know what that looks like for in the future, but I just am going moment by moment, step by step. And um, just being a data entry person is not me. I used to think, because I scored really high on working with computers, so I used to think I was going to be a computer programmer, but I need to be with people. Even though I'm an introvert, I need people. I And that we all are social beings uh, to some aspect, but I have a heavy teaching placement. So uh, that's where, that's what it is. Um, so yeah, I got laid off a couple of times and, (laughs) uh, yeah, now I'm in demand. They like teachers. Oh my gosh, there's a shortage. And so if you want to be a teacher, you would be in demand always, um, with, but let me give you a caveat. If you want to go into teacher, into teaching, let me know. Because I can give you the good, bad, and ugly. Okay. While I was teaching at a seminar in Barcelona, a student shared a personal story. He said, you know, Mabel, at one point I was a millionaire and then I lost everything. I actually owe a lot of money now. When I was a multimillionaire, the only thing I did was to work, work, work. 
I considered myself a very important person doing very important things. So, for example, I didn't spend time with my little daughter because I was very busy doing important, quote-unquote, things. Do you know what, Mabel? Now I spend more time with my daughter, and this time is precious to me. I am grateful. I connect with nature. I appreciate things I never appreciated before. Okay, I think we're going to stop there. Um, I will try to pick this up within the next few days because I really don't like being halfway in a chapter. But I'm going to listen to my body and my inner child and uh, give myself the rest that they would like. And trust that we will pick this up soon. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the box below. And I'll get to them as soon as possible. And wherever you're at in the world, I hope you're having a wonderful day or evening. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for being here. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye.